We are continuing in Ephesians. Actually, we're ending in Ephesians. I'm very sad today. Uh, but this is, a, this is a good thing. For instance, this last week, uh, my son John and I were sitting uh, at home, uh, killing some time late in the evening, and uh, a movie came on TV, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And I love that movie. I didn't realize, do you, you know how old that movie is? It's really old. 1979. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking, oh, this is a great movie. And John says, yeah, this is a great movie. We'll watch this. This is awesome, you know. And all the way through it, as the scenes are going through, uh, John and I are saying, oh, this thing coming up next. This is so cool. Watch this. You know, and go, oh, yeah, I like that too, you know. And so we're, we're actually, you know, we're anticipating every scene. But that didn't wreck the movie for us. That, that actually was a cool thing. So what we're going to do today, think of Ephesians today. Uh, we're going to go through it like an old movie since we've been studying it since last December. I'm going to read through the whole book for you today. What? Yeah, okay. Now hold on before you get kind of crazy and say, I'm out of here. Um, and think of it as, as we're coming up to different sections, like John and I with different parts of Close Encounters, like, oh, this next part, you know? And then when we read that part, you go, oh. Wasn't that awesome? Okay, so, so this is your way of kind of bringing back to mind what we've been looking at since last October, actually. It was before, before Halloween we started Ephesians. So as we go through, this is your way of standing back and go, Ooh, oh, mm, yeah, oh. And, and you know, if you, feel, if you feel really, you know, pushed to turn to the person next to you and say, this next section's great. That's okay. We can do that, okay? So, uh, but listen to it. This, you know, one of the things I've often said is that uh, the reading of the scriptures out loud in church is almost never done. I mean, it's almost never. When was the last time you walked into a church and they read a huge section of scripture to you and that was all they did? Almost, almost never. And yet, when Paul wrote this letter, and all the letters you find in the New Testament, they were written to people who were illiterate. They were meant that the one or two literate people in the village would say, hey, we got a new letter from Paul. Let's all gather around and listen. And it would be read, and it would be read, and it would be read and read. So we're basically going back to what they did 2,000 years ago where they'd take these incredible letters and read them out loud and just sit and go, oh, yes, oh, ooh. Okay, so you can do that if you, you know, I won't point at you. <laughs> Look at the face they're making. So we're going to go through, and we're going to read through the entire thing. Now, before we get to it, um, the question is, is what version do you read out of? So I'm going to give you a really quickie about the different English versions. I've said this before, but there's some confusion about it. And if you've come out of an LDS background, there's even more confusion about the English versions. So let me just tell you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of versions to pick from. So I brought a few with me today. <coughs> uh, for instance, there are, there are um, translations in English that are meant to be very literal in the sense that if you take the original language, which is Greek... And you take the Greek language and you say, okay, here's a Greek word, and we have the Greek text. We have, here's this Greek word. I'm going to translate an English word for that. And it's almost a one-for-one -one Greek to English translation, that kind of thing, which sounds like the best way to do a translation. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Bibles that are like that. The one I use all the time is the New American Standard. That's, that's their intention. In fact, their intention is so much like that that when you read it, if there's an italicized English word, that word has no Greek counterpart or Hebrew counterpart. So every other word has a one-for-one. One. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, there's other literal translations like that. King James is one of them. That was the, that in 1611, that was, their, that was their strategy was to do that. And in fact, the whole idea about italicizing non-original language words, that came from the guys who did the King James. So when you read the King James, you see italicized letters and words. They're not putting those in italicized to emphasize them. They're just saying there's no Greek or Hebrew word for that. Um, Joseph Smith, when he retranslated the Bible, decided to take out all the italicized ones because they're probably not necessary. Okay, anyway, um, and then uh, today, probably one of the most popular, one of the most popular uh, literal translations is the ESV, the English Standard Version. Really good, and it's, again, it's a one-for-one. -one. Uh, and, and you'd say, well, if there's a one-for-one -one translation, if you read those side by side, don't they sound almost the same? Yes. <laughs> They're almost, if you take whole sections of the ESV, English Standard, and the New American Standard, which was started back in 1972, and you put them alongside, they're almost identical. A third very popular literal translation is the New King James, where they took out some of the Old English uh, and left in the word one for one. Again, you put those three side by side, they're almost identical, they're just slightly variations. The downside to having a literal translation is that it doesn't sound very English. 
the, the, the sentence construction is kind of clumsy. It's just like if I was going to translate a sentence right now from French into English, I would use an English way of saying it, but it wouldn't be a one-for-one word thing. See, to make it, so to make it the, intelligible, the idea. Uh, when you move away from literals, you have a middle ground uh, where there's a little more looseness in terms of how you translate it so, it so it just sounds better in English grammar. There's a whole class in there. NIV is the king in that realm right there. NIV is a middle ground between literal and paraphrase in that sense. Um, another one which is much older is this one. J.B. Phillips did one. This is called the cookbook edition. Can you tell why? Yeah. Uh, uh, we were studying a book written by J.B. Phillips in adult Sunday school a while back, and uh, he decided to do one for, it's called In Modern English for Schools. Um, but this is moving more toward a paraphrase. This is an idea of taking the thought for a sentence and putting it in your own words so that the thought is maintained, but the words may be totally non-one-for-one one with the Greek. But, the, but it's interesting because now what you get in something like this is someone putting it in their own words, which is kind of cool. It reads really easy. It's really easy because of the English issues. Uh, the same is true of this one right here, the message. Maybe you've seen this before. Uh, this is, Eugene Peterson did his own translation. Again, it's a paraphrase or away from the literal side to the kind of put it in your own words stuff. This is Eugene Peterson putting it in his own words. The idea in the sentences is maintained, but the words don't have any one-to-one -one correspondence. And you'd say, well, now wait a second. Isn't that kind of sloppy? How do we know that these guys are handling the word really well in their interpretation? And that's a very good question in paraphrases. These are paraphrases. Very good question. So you really have to understand where that Eugene Peterson is on top of his game theologically, because he's going to put in a lot of his own way of saying something that is going to put a bent to the idea. So that's really important in this whole realm of the paraphrases, which are loosely translated, I mean, in their own words. Uh, this, the message... Uh, just like that one, Phillips for the American, or for the uh, student version. There's a whole ton. The Living Bible, if you've heard of that, and the New Living, those are all very paraphrasy. So you've got to understand whether they're coming, if they're, if they're putting it in their own words theologically, right? So that's a big deal. And then finally, if you don't trust any of them, you can get some Bibles that have multiple versions in them. <laughs> this one's got, if you see right here, it's got, see it's got four columns? That's because this one's got King James. This is Amplified, which is very paraphrased in their own words. New American Standard, which is very literal. And then New International and NIV, which is in between. So if you're, if you're thinking, gee, I wonder, wonder what these passages, well, these are all the same passages in four different Bibles, then you can compare them. Kind of cool. So what are we going to read from today? Something that's easy to listen to to do large chunks. So we're going back to Eugene Peterson, the message, okay? Now this, I, I just bring this up because this is a great technique when you're reading the Word. When, you've go, when you're going into a section of the Word you've never read before, for instance. There might be huge sections. I've never read that book before. I always start with something like this so I can read the whole thing. You can sit down in 20 minutes, read the whole book, and it's breezy. You don't get stuck on ideas. It's just, it's really easy. Then when I dive down to look at every verse at a time, like what we've been doing since October, then, then what, I, what I like to do is go into a more literal version like the New American Standard or the ESV or, or the New King James, something like that. And then once I've actually worked my way through with this sort of this low-level verse at a time thing and this very literal thing, then I, when I get done, like we are right now, when I get done, I like to stand back again and say, you know, I've read every word of this letter. I'm going to go back and fly over it again on something easy. And then, and then I know what he's talking about. And see, I can see if I agree with how Eugene Peterson put it in his own words, the different sections, because we've already studied it, almost down to the Greek. In fact, we learned a great Greek word in, he, in, in, in going through Ephesians. Remember the one about being subject to one another? Do you remember that word? It looks like a hula hoop with tassels on it. Hupotasso, hupotasso, yeah. Yeah, be subject to one another. So we, we even looked at the Greek. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this. To help you figure out where we're at, I've got an outline that I'm going to show as we go along here. And uh, this is what it looks like. Here's chapters 1, 2, and 3. If you remember, 1, 2, and 3 talk about our vertical relationship with God, uh, where we're at now in this new life uh, with Christ and, uh, and just between you and God. And that's, the, that's sort of the, if you want to, the theory. Um, that, that's the doctrine of where we're at. But then in 4, 5, and 6, it gets really super practical, and this is how we live this out in a daily level, kind of horizontally. So 1, 2, and 3, our vertical relationship with God. 4, 5, 6, our horizontal relationship with people, and how that matters, how it changes because of that. So as we go along here, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll click us way through this so we can keep track of what chapter we're in, and you'll see when we go from the 
a vertical orientation and emphasis over to the horizontal one. So we're going to start with chapter 1 right here. And uh, this is Ephesians. And I would just invite you to sit back and listen carefully and act like I've, I've seen this movie before. I'm going to enjoy these words. Yeah. Okay? So here we go. We start with Ephesians 1. In Eugene Peterson's The Message. I, Paul, and under and under God's plan as an apostle, uh, a special agent of Jesus Christ, in fact, writing to you, faithful Christians in Ephesus, I greet you, and with grace and peace poured into our lives by God our Father and our Master Jesus Christ. How blessed is God, and what a blessing he is. He's the Father of our Master Jesus Christ, and he takes us to the high places of blessing in him, to all of them. In fact, long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind. He had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. See, see, long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. And what pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift-giving by the hand of his beloved son, us. And because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by our own misleading deeds. And not just barely free, abundantly free. He thought of everything. He he provided for everything that we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making for us. I mean, he set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are, and what we are living for. I mean, long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the, of the overall purpose, he's working out in everything and everyone. And it's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation, you found yourselves home free. Signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This this signet from God is the first installment on what's coming. A reminder that that we'll get everything God has planned for us. A praising and a glorious life. And that's why when I heard of the solid trust that you have in the Master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the Christians, well, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. I mean, every time, every time I did, I prayed. I, I think of you and I... I would give thanks, but I do more than thank. I ask, and I ask the God in our Master Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally, your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what it is he's calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for Christians. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Endless energy, boundless strength. And all this energy, all this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death, set him on a throne in deep heaven, in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments. No name, no power exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks And he acts by which he fills everything with his presence. Chapter 2. You know, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. 
You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. I mean, you filled your lungs with polluted unbelief, and then you exhale disobedience. And, well, we all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. You know, it's a wonder God didn't lose his temper, do away with the whole lot of us. But instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives, and he made us alive in Christ. And he did all this on his own, with no help from us. It was him. And then he picked us up, and he set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now, God has us where he wants us. <laughs> with all the time in this world and all the time in the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. See, it's Christ. in Christ, it's God's gift from start to finish. We didn't play a major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. But no, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he's already he's gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. But don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you outsiders to God's ways had no idea of any of this. I mean, you didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea about Christ, I mean, you knew nothing of the rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel. You hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. But now, because of Christ, dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it altogether are in on everything. Everything. The Messiah has made things up between us so that now... We're now together on this, both the non-Jewish outsiders and the Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall that we used to keep each other at a distance with. He repealed the, the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. And then he started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. And it's Christ. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Christ came, he preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equal. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. What? That's plain enough, isn't it? <laughs> You're, you are no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. See, God is building a home. God's building a home, and he's using us all, irrespective of how we got here, in what he's building. He used, he used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. That's true. And now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day. A holy temple built by God. And all of us? built into it a temple in which God is quite at home. Chapter 3. So this is why I, Paul, am in jail for Christ. <laughs> Having taken up the cause of you outsiders, so-called, I take it that you're familiar with uh, the part I was given in God's plan for including everybody. I got the inside story on this from God himself, as I just wrote you in brief. And as you read over what I've written to you, you'll be able to, and without, you'll, whoops, you'll be able, sorry, stuck page, that didn't make any sense. You'll be able to see for yourselves into the mystery of Christ. 
None of our ancestors understood this. Only in our time has it been made clear by God's Spirit through his holy apostles and the prophets of this new order of things. The mystery is that people who have never heard of God and those who have heard of him all their lives, both, what I've been calling outsiders and insiders, they both stand on the same ground before God. They get the same offer, the same help, the same promises in Christ Jesus, and the message itself is accessible and welcoming to everyone across the board. This is my life work, helping people understand and respond to this message. You know, it came as a sheer gift to me, a real surprise, God handling all the details. And when it came to presenting the message to people who had no background in God's way, I was the least qualified of any of the available Christians to do it. But... God saw to it, and I was equipped, but you can be sure that it had nothing to do with my natural abilities. And so, here I am, preaching and writing about things that are way over my head, (laughs) the inexhaustible riches and generosity of Christ. My task is to bring out into the open and make plain what God who created all this in the first place, what he has been doing in secret and behind the scenes all along through Christians like yourselves gathered in churches. This extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. All this is proceeding along lines planned all along by God and then executed through Christ Jesus. When we trust him, we're free to say whatever needs to be said, bold to go wherever we need to go. So don't let my present trouble on your behalf get you down. Be proud. So my response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask him to strengthen you by his Spirit. Not not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength, that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, that you'll be able to take in with all the Christians the the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love, to reach out and experience the breadth, to, to test its length, to plumb the depths of it, to rise to the heights of it, to live full lives, full in the fullness of God. You know, God can do anything, you know, far more than you can imagine, or even guess, or even request in your wildest dreams, far more. And he does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Oh, glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah, in Jesus. Glory down all the generations. Glory through all millennia. Oh, yes! Chapter 4. Oops. Go back. Chapter 4. Here we go. Okay. So in light of all of this that we've been talking about, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. No, better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark you, mark that you do this with humility, all of this, and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences, quick, at mending fences. You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction, to stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who rules over all, who works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. But, That doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. No, no, no. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift 
Uh, The text for this in the Old Testament says this. He climbed the highest mountain, he captured the enemy, seized the booty, and he handed it out in gifts to the people. And it's true, is it not? That the one who climbed up also climbed down to the valley of the earth. And the one who climbed down is the one who climbed back up, up at the highest heaven again. Well, he handed out gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, a prophet, of evangelist, of a pastor teacher to train Christians in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. So, No prolonged infancies among us, please. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth, to tell it in love, like Christ in everything. And we take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've, they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore. Feeling no pain, they let themselves go in sexual obsession and addicted to every sort of perversion. But that's no life for you. That is not life. You learned Christ. And my assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth, precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we don't have the excuse of ignorance. I mean everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life, It has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Now, what this adds up to then is this. No more lies. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. So when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. Get it? So go ahead, be angry sometimes. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Did you used to make ends meet by stealing? Hmm? Well, no more. Get an honest job so that, well, so that you can help others who can't work. And by the way, watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. Each word a gift to others. And don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. But make a, make a clean break with all the cutting and the backbiting and the profane talk. No, be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly, well as God in Christ forgave you. Chapter 5. So watch what God does, and then you do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. I mean, mostly what God does is, well, is love, you. So keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but it was extravagant. (laughs) He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. So love like that. And don't allow love to turn into lust. 
setting off a downhill slide into sexual promiscuity and filthy practices or, or, or bullying greed. Though some tongues just love the taste of gossip, Christians, you have better uses for language than that. Hmm? So don't talk dirty or silly. That, that kind of talk doesn't fit our style. Thanksgiving, that's our dialect. You can be sure that using people or religion or things just for what you can get out of them, you know, the usual variations on idolatry, that'll get you nowhere. And certainly nowhere near the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God. So don't let yourselves get taken in by religious smooth talk. God gets furious with people who are full of religious sales talk but want nothing to do with him. Don't even hang around people like that. No, you, you groped your way through that murk once, but no longer. You're out in the open now. The bright light of Christ makes your way plain. So no more stumbling around. Just, just get on with it. The good, the right, the true, these, these are the actions appropriate for daylight hours. Figure out what will please Christ and do that. And don't waste your time with useless work, mere busy work. You know, the barren pursuits of darkness. In fact, expose these things for the sham that they are. It's a scandal when people waste their lives on things they must do in the darkness where no one will see. Rip the cover off those frauds. See how attractive they look in the light of Christ. From the Old Testament, wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Christ will show you the light. So watch your step. Use, use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. And don't drink too much wine. I mean, that cheapens life. No, drink the Spirit of God. Huge drafts of Him. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Yeah, yeah. Sing songs from your, from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything. Any excuse for a song to God the Father in the name of the Master Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. For instance, wives. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that, well, that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife in, in the same way that Christ does to his church. Not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises his leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Now, husbands, huh, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love that was marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And this is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor, you know, since they're already one in marriage. And, and, and husbands, no one abuses his own body, does he? no. He feeds and pampers it. And that's how Christ treats us, the church, since we're all part of his body. And, and this is why a man leaves his father and mother and cherishes his wife. No longer two, they become one flesh. And this is, a, this is a huge mystery, I admit. And I don't pretend to understand it all. But what is clearest to me is the way Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself in loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. Chapter 6. Now, children, <laughs> children, do what your parents tell you. This is only right. I mean, honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with ha which has a promise attached to it. Namely, so you'll live well and have a long life. And fathers... Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand. Lead them in the way of the master. 
and servants or employees. Respectfully obey your earthly masters, but always, always with an eye to obeying the real master, Christ. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants doing what God wants you to do. And work with a smile on your face, always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, you're really serving God. Good work will get you good pay from the master, regardless of whether you're a slave or free. And masters, masters, it's the same for you. Yeah. No abuse, please, and no threats, please. You and your servants are both under the same master in heaven. He makes no distinction between you and them. Just saying. Well, that about wraps it up. God is strong. He wants you to be strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so that you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. You know, this is no afternoon athletic contest that, we're, that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple hours. You know, this, this is for keeps. This is a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. So be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Far more. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation. They're more than just words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon, his word. And in the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard, pray long. Pray for your brothers and sisters and keep your eyes open. Oh, keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind, so that no one drops out. And while you're at it, don't forget to pray for me. Pray that I'll know what to say and have the courage to say it at the right time, telling the mystery to one and all, the message that, that I, jailbird preacher that I am, I'm responsible for getting out. Tychicus, my good friend here, will tell you what I'm doing and how things are going with me. He's certainly, oh, certainly a dependable servant to the master. I've sent him not only to tell you about us, but to cheer you on in your faith. Goodbye, friends. Love mixed with faith be yours from God the Father and from the Master Jesus Christ. Pure grace and nothing but pure grace be with you all of you who love our master, Jesus Christ. The end. See how fast that goes? Paul. Eugene Peterson. That's, his, that's in his own words what that is. You know, when we started this, we looked and I said, here's one of the most amazing verses you'll ever read in the entire, in the entire Bible. And it was sort of our theme as we started into Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Already done, already complete, the end. Every spiritual blessing. But yet, as I read through it, and maybe you had the same experience, other verses leaped out, and this one just makes me crumble to my knees every time I read it. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's a big verse. <laughs> Not only because God's love is big, but because in the end, life is all about being filled with the fullness of who God is. The message of Ephesians is God has come and taken a people who were not a people and gathered them to himself and given them life through Christ. And now we get to explore with everyone who's ever been called the gigantic dimensions of his love. So anyone that tells you that Christianity is an organization, it's really not. It's it's an adventure toward understanding that God who loves us, who draws us to himself, who fills us with himself. 
for the purpose of us understanding the dimensionless boundaries of his love. That's what it's all about. And if somehow in the entire process, as you read the word or as you fellowship, if there's something about the love of God that's not getting bigger and bigger and under, in your understanding until you suddenly realize, I'm never going to get my arms around this, then you're on the right track because <laughs> you'll never get your arms around that. Let's quit. <clears throat> Next week, we're going to go to Genesis. Now, the, I had a discussion years ago with a guy who's in our, the first video we did, the DNA versus the Book of Mormon, Tom Murphy, who uh, uh, was in there talking about DNA. Anyway, I sat, I sat next to him at dinner one night, and I said, Tom, now that you know that the Book of Mormon is probably not historical, uh, why don't you become a Christian? <laughs> I just put it right out there. And you know what he told me in response? Because of Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Well, what's wrong with Genesis 1 through 11? And we started going on about, well, that's where the creation is, God created, that's where the fall of mankind, the making of man, that's the, 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 you know, the nation, the Tower of Babel, and Noah and the Ark, and all that. He looked at me and says, you believe all that stuff? I said, well, yeah. And he says, and that's why I can't be a Christian, because I can never believe that stuff. So what I'm telling you is, this is a troubled area of the Bible for so many people, because actually starting after chapter 11, actually in chapter 11, we take a look at people. It starts with Abraham, and it goes on through the nation of Israel. It's people, 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 people. But up through here, it's all about where we came from. And, and you know, are the dinosaurs in there? And what about, I mean, how does all this stuff work? So uh, we're going to, as we go through the summer, we're going to casually go through the narrative of Genesis 1 through 11. We can ask all the questions we want about, uh, excuse me, he actually breathed life into our nostrils? Yeah, <laughs> wow. So we'll talk about all that kind of stuff, and we'll look at those things, and we'll, we'll just get our arms around Genesis 1 through 11. It's an incredible thing. But keep in mind as we do that, Genesis 1 through 11, how God started this whole ball rolling in the universe was for the purpose, for the climax of what we just read in Ephesians that we might be filled with the fullness of who he is and understand the dimensionlessness of his love. That's why it's all there. So in Genesis 1 through 11, how did God get the ball rolling so that his creation, us, can come to enjoy who he is? <sighs> Great stuff. Real quick. Okay. The Bible says that God created the earth in six days, not six days. Yeah, six days, uh-huh. right? Right, right. And then he created man. Right. Where do the dinosaurs fit in there? Good, le- good leading question for next week, because that's next week. So hold that question. Hold that question. You do some study on that. I'll do some study on that. We'll compare notes when we get back together, and we'll find out what that's all about. Genesis 1 for next week. So just read Genesis 1. Okay, let's pray. Thank God. Father, we do indeed thank you for your, your great grace to us in bringing us these words. And Lord, as I, as I read through again this letter of Ephesians, my heart just leaps. It just leaps what you've done on our behalf in drawing us, bringing us to yourself, when we could never earn it, never will be able to pay you back for it. And yet, the incredible gift of coming to relationship with you and starting to understand in our small, puny ways just how enormous your love is for us. And Lord, we understand on the flip side of that, as as he mentioned in Ephesians, that there are so many people who haven't got a clue I just don't know any of this stuff. Don't know that there is a God, a creator, whose intention is not to be punitive to mankind, but to bring life to mankind. And yet mankind, by and large, thumbs his nose at you. So Lord, I pray that as our hearts um, leap as we read through Ephesians, that you would give us a new compassion for those for whom these words mean nothing. Mean nothing. And that And that perhaps, Lord, through your grace, that through us and the the words that we speak, that some might come to know of this incredible loving kindness you have for those who respond to you. So thank you for these great words, and we look forward to your spirit teaching us as we go into Genesis. Give us understanding and give us a, a view to all the work you went through to be able to bring us into fellowship with you. So thank you for all these incredible things now in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.